All right, check, check, check. Okay, here we are, last, second last class. Wow. So we just have to finish um, the final chapter of our textbook, um, which of course, if you remember uh, from last time, is all about the nature and existence of God. Um, and these are not uh, simply um, theological questions. They're not just religious questions. You know, does God exist? And if God does exist, what is God's nature? Rather, um, in addition to being those things, they are metaphysical questions. That is why we are interested in them as philosophers. So just uh, let's uh, well, well, let's get the screen share going here. Um, and then we're going to begin. Uh, now, um, last time we learned about the divine attributes. So just by way of recollection, um, we covered most of them, not all of them. We say, we're saving one from today for, uh, for today. We were saving omnibenevolence or being all good for today. But the other divine attributes that we covered include omnipotence. So God is supposed to be all powerful. God is supposed to be um, omniscient. So God is supposed to be all knowing. <clears throat> Uh, God is supposed to be um, impassable, so mental states. Uh, he's not subject to changes in mental states. Uh, God is supposed to be eternal, so God exists. God did exist for going all the way back into the past, or and he will always exist, or God is outside of time. Uh, which which ones have I covered? We did omnipotence, omniscience, um, eternality, and impassibility. Am I missing one? I feel like I'm missing one. Omnipresence. Ah, right, right. Oh, of course, because of that joke. Um, yeah, omnipresence. God is supposed to be present everywhere in some sense or another thanks bronwyn um we covered these two arguments uh the argument from design and the argument from uh oh it's the second last class and my brain's not working the argument from design and the cosmological argument um Impassibility. Impassibility is what I meant to say. Immutability is another uh, kind of uh, maybe a sub a sub category of impassibility. Um, yeah, Im Im impassibility. So God is impassible. He's not subject to changes in mental states. This was the questionable one, right? Because, um, of course, it, it depends on. Well, what God are we talking about, right? I know that the God of the Old and the New Testaments are the same, technically, but the depiction of God that we get in the Old Testament is, is of, a you know, an angry, jealous, vengeful God. And in the New Testament, it's this sort of lovey-dovey sort of God. So um, it would seem that God is actually passable um, uh, in any case. Uh, so we looked at the um, argument from design, which is an a posteriori argument, right? We look at the world and we see purpose. Uh, we see teleology. So that implies design, and that in turn implies a designer, and that designer is supposed to be God. And that's what William Paley's famous argument about the watchmaker is all about. If you were crossing a heath and you found a watch, you would assume it has a designer. Well, um, we should be doing that with all the works of nature. And of course, the designer is God. Um, we saw the challenges posed to this view, however. Um, natural selection is a sort of blind designer. There is design, but there's no purpose or intention. Uh, then the cosmological argument um, was supposed to uh, explain why there is something rather than nothing. And of course, something cannot come from nothing. It can't be contingent beings all the way back. 
there must be some necessary being which is the cause or the source of all of the contingent beings. It's also an a posteriori argument. But this argument is an a priori argument, the ontological argument, the ontological argument here. Ontology, remember, is the study of being. So this argument tries to show um, that because that owing to God's nature, um, in specifically the the perfection of God, God must necessarily exist. And this was first put forward by Anselm of Canterbury all the way back in the uh, in the uh, well. This would be, I guess, well, mostly the tenth, no, the eleventh, the eleventh and twelfth centuries. He was a monk um, living in Canterbury uh, in, uh, in Great Britain. A lot of people have put their own spin on his argument. Um, I won't name all the examples, but uh, Rene Descartes, um, if, you, if you read all of his meditations, I know we looked at uh, all the way back in the beginning of the class, we looked at... Um, some ideas from the first two meditations, but if you make your way into the rest of the meditations, you find that Descartes offers his own version of this argument, which is interesting. Um, so Anselm's looking for a sort of master argument, Crumley tells us, uh, a, a sort of knockdown argument, an argument to end all arguments when it comes to the existence of God, something that even an atheist would understand. I'll explain what I mean here. I'm going to read the entire quote uh, from, uh, from Anselm. Now we believe that you, God, are something than which nothing greater that uh, can be thought. So can it be that no such nature exists since uh, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God? So even the fool must admit that this something than which nothing greater can be thought exists at least in the understanding, since he understands this when he hears it. And surely that than which nothing greater cannot be thought cannot exist only in the understanding. For if it exists only in the understanding, then that which a greater cannot be thought is that than which a greater can be thought. But this is clearly impossible. Therefore, there is no doubt that something than which a greater cannot be thought exists, both in the understanding and the reality. Now, this seems like a mouthful, right? But what is Anselm actually saying here? Anyone want to take a guess? Or not take a guess, but try to explain? I mean, here, this. let's start with this. Uh, line from uh, Psalm um, 14, chapter 14, verse 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. The fool here means the atheist. Um, <laughs> and, uh, even he doesn't know what he's saying. Well, no, he has a pretty good idea what he's saying. I'll explain it. Um, well, Christian, that's close. That's kind of, this is what he means. Um, remember that Anselm is, wants an argument that even an atheist or a fool would understand. Uh, not quite. That's a good guess. That's a good guess. Um, Chantal, that's a good guess, but not quite. Um, so... Oh, back to the chat. Um, it's, yeah, maybe it's kind of similar to a conceivability argument. <laughs> uh, I'll explain it. So he's talking, uh, he wants an argument that even an atheist could understand, because atheists are fools, apparently. Um, now, uh, he's saying basically this. Look, think of a being greater than which nothing can be thought. The greatest being you can think of. Well, that's God, right? 
the greatest thing with all of the greatest perfections that you can conceive of is God. Okay. And, and, and we all agree that this idea exists in the understanding, right? That which um, nothing greater can be conceived is God. And it exists in the understanding. So we're all clear on that, right? If we think of the greatest thing that it's possible to conceive of, you cannot conceive of anything greater than this thing. That thing must be God, right? Everyone following me? I'll just check in with the with the chat here, see, see if anyone's confused. So um, yes, Hannah's got it. Excellent. So we all understand the first part. Even the atheist who Anselm takes for a fool, even an atheist can understand. Oh, yeah, greater than greater than that which can be. Con blah, 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 blah. It exists in the understanding. Great. But hang on, that can't be the greatest thing you can think of. After all. It would be greater if you actually existed. So the greatest thing you can conceive of, God, is only the greatest thing because it exists in the understanding and in reality. God is perfect, and part of that perfection must be his necessary existence. We can schematize it like this. So this is how Crumley, whoopsie-daisy, this is how Crumley lays it out. Let me just hide myself here. Oh, someone's in the chat. Yep. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Milan. That's the that's the perfect island response, which we'll get to. Uh, but let's make sure we all understand the ontological argument first. So the first premise, God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. So, okay, that we're just going to stipulate that's what God is. He, he It is the being than which nothing greater can be thought and this entity premise two than which nothing greater can be thought exists at least in the understanding now either it exists only in the understanding or also outside of the mind now it's greater to exist outside of the mind than to exist only in the mind so if this is really the greatest thing that one can conceive of if God is really that then which nothing greater can be thought, then God must be thought of as existing outside as well as inside the understanding. Therefore, God exists. So the key thing about this argument is it turns on this shared conception of God as a perfect being, which even the atheist has. And that's, that's really Anselm's target audience here. Even an atheist who understands the concept of God as that than which nothing greater can be thought, who simply rejects the idea that God exists, has to admit that, well, if it's really a being than which nothing greater can be thought, it must exist in reality as well as in the understanding. That's the argument. So it's the ontological argument because it appeals to God's nature, again, namely God's perfection to try and show that God must necessarily exist. Now, uh, Milan has uh, an excellent point. You can absolutely imagine something existing without it actually existing. And that is the perfect island criticism of Anselm's argument. So a monk named uh, Gaunilo identified the same problem. You can imagine the existence of a perfect anything and you can try and prove it this way. Take, for example, a perfect island. A perfect island has all kinds of riches. It's a tropical paradise. It's just, it's the perfect island. Um, think of the best island ever times a thousand. Um, it's got the best climate, the best beaches. Gold and gems are strewn about the beach. There's an open bar open. Uh, it's 24-7 open bar. It's the perfect island, right? Suppose someone tells me all this, uh, Gaunilo said. The story is easily told and involves no difficulty, and so I understand it. But if this person went on to draw a conclusion and say, 
you cannot any longer doubt that this island, more excellent than all the others on Earth, truly exists somewhere in reality. For you do not doubt that this island exists in your understanding, and since it is more excellent to exist not merely in the understanding, but also in reality, this island must also exist in reality. So what do you think? Do you agree with Gaunilo's criticism of the ontological argument? Do you think that perhaps he's got Anselm wrong? Let's hear from some of you. I'll go first. I mean, I will say, and again, this is my opinion. This is not something, if you disagree with me, it's not something I'd penalize you for. Um, but I agree with Gaunilo's criticism. Absolutely. In fact, um, like uh, Milan, I've I thought of this myself before I read this criticism, before I ever read this. I thought, well, wait, I can imagine the perfect anything, and it doesn't mean that it exists. Um, but then maybe you maybe you think that it's not really about what you can imagine. It's it's about what God is, like what the definition of God the concept the way we conceive of god anselm would say means he's got to exist if he's really perfect he must actually exist so what do we think what do we think let's open up the chat do we agree with anselm or do we agree with uh gaunilo gaunilo i'm actually not sure how we say that yeah, I'm sympathetic to that, Daisy. Um, Ryan says, sort of a misunderstanding of what Anselm meant. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, I mean, maybe we can have it both ways, right? Maybe um, Gaunilo is not really understanding Anselm. Maybe he's, he's, he's not responding in the best way, but he still is making a valid point. Because um, again, it's not about, the imagination for Anselm. It's about the concept of God, right? That's the important takeaway. And that's what Ganilo might be missing here. Yeah, but then again, you know, Milan, you could be right. I personally am sympathetic to Ganilo. Like I said, I think that, sure, I, I mean, and you can say, oh, but uh, it's not about the imagination. It's about the concept of God. Okay, well, maybe I employ my concept of a perfect island. Um, my perfect island um, has all the amenities one could desire, uh, outstanding natural beauty, lovely beaches, um, cool wildlife, cool plants and animals and all of that right um does that mean it necessarily exists because it's greater to exist in reality well of course not um yeah okay maybe the counter art oh you mean the other formulation of the of the ontological argument ryan um yeah i mean yeah i mean that's fine i uh, you know, maybe, maybe also, um, one of the differences is that, uh, an island is a contingent thing, but the, that which nothing greater can be thought, um, is supposed to be a necessary being gone, right? Maybe it's different when we're talking about contingent beings versus necessary beings. So Ansel might say, well, hang on there, Gaunilo, what I'm actually talking about is a perfect um a perfect the most perfect thing we can think of what gaunilo is talking about is a perfect kind of thing in this case island the most perfect island uh we could do the same thing uh like imagine uh, uh i i i imagine um the uh, a uh, a cat greater uh than which no cat can be conceived so i have the perfect cat this cat is um is uh is is chonky yet athletic has uh really awesome whiskers a very distinguished gentleman um and uh not only um 
Not only must you earn his affection as one does with cats, um, but he can also do tricks, right? So say I conceive of this perfect cat. Well, it, it you know, just imagining this doesn't mean that this particular cat that's the best of all cats is going to pop into existence or must exist simply because um, it's the most perfect cat, right? Um, but Anselm would say that misses the point. I'm talking about the most perfect kind, uh, the most perfect thing we can conceive of, God, not a perfect kind of thing, like a perfect island, a perfect cat, a perfect dinner, or something like that. Yeah, I mean, really, there is something platonic. Um, he is thinking about perfection the way Plato understood perfection as something eternal and grasped by the intellect. So, you know, right there in Anselm, you can see the long shadow that Plato casts over Western philosophy. But that's a good point, Robin. That's a very good point. Um, well, you know, Ganilo's um, objections uh, are important, but probably the most widely endorsed objection is from Immanuel Kant. Kant said that existence uh, is not a property. It's not a perfection. Um, by saying that something exists, we don't really add anything to the to the concept. I can add things to a concept like um, my concept of a cup, for example, say a cup. Well, I can add something by giving it properties. Maybe I give the cup a color, uh, uh, precise dimensions. Um, maybe I give it other physical properties. Maybe it's a really good insulator, so it keeps my cold stuff cold and my warm stuff warm. These properties all add something to my concept of this cup, my mental item of a particular cup. But Kant would deny that existence is like that. You don't add anything. You don't lose anything. You don't add anything by saying a thing exists, and you don't lose anything by saying it doesn't. Existence is not a property. Um, now, if you agree with Kant, fine. If you agree with Anselm, then you might respond by saying that, well, sometimes existence does add something. Crumley's example is like of a of a concept car, right? Um, like, oh, what if I what if I actually build my concept car? Now it actually exists, and it's not just a concept anymore. I've added something with existence. Um, although I do tend to agree with Kant on this one. Um, Uh, you can imagine a perfect anything, an existence, uh, just saying, oh, by the way, it exists, doesn't add anything. Yeah, good point. And maybe it just ceases to become a concept car. Maybe the actual car is 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 different than the concept car. So I have a concept of a concept car, but a concept of the actual car as well. Yeah, fair point. Or maybe if you also are sympathetic to what Anselm is saying, you could take, uh, oh, excuse me, take a similar line of argument to Charles Hartshorn or Norman Malcolm. So they make reference to this formulation of the ontological argument. Uh, quote, for it is possible to think that something exists that cannot be thought not to exist, and such a being is greater than one that can be thought not to exist. So here, what we're talking about is necessary existence, not simple, simple existence. So Malcolm's argument at any rate goes like this. Um, God's existence is either necessary or impossible. Now, since our concept of God is not self-contradictory, then God's existence is possible. And because it's possible, it's necessary. Because necessary existence 
is a part of our concept of God. And Hartshorn does a similar proof with this using modal logic. Modal logic is all about possibility. It's the logic of possible worlds. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that this adds anything? Do you think this buttresses Anselm's point? Or are you still uh, perhaps uh, skeptical? And by the way, you know, one thing that I, I really should uh, I really should say is that even if you don't buy these arguments, that doesn't mean that you uh, are automatically an atheist or something, right? Um, not that there's anything wrong with being an atheist. However, um, you know, where wh whether you think these kinds of arguments are necessary might depend on how you think about belief. So, for example, you know, Anselm, Aquinas, um, you know, a lot of these theologians who were also philosophers, um, they saw the importance of reason. And that's the, the contribution of the Greek rationalist tradition to Western thought. You know, the, the influence of the Abrahamic religions is a lot more apparent. Um, but we are equally influenced by the Greeks. Um, and the Greeks were all about reason. So some of these Christian philosophers were like, wow, these Greek thinkers, you know, your Aristotles, your Plato's, they, they were pagans, but they used reason and they figured out a lot about God, even though they weren't Christian. Um, Christianity, yeah, Christianity did not exist during the time of Plato, Socrates and Aristotle, right? Didn't exist. So, um, you know, that convinced people like, um, uh, like uh, St. Anselm uh, to use philosophy to try and understand God. But that is not really, um, you know, that's something that came after. Because, of course, the big, the big idea here is that you take, is that you, is that you believe on faith. So if you really believe, you don't need these arguments, right? So Nicholas says, uh, oh, the goal of the theologian is not to provide absolute proofs of God, but reasons for atheists to doubt their beliefs. Interesting. Yeah, I guess you could kind of think of it like that. Although, um, although some theologians would see what they are doing as giving certain proof. Um, although, incidentally, Aquinas did not agree with the ontological argument which is really interesting. Um, but yeah, I suppose maybe you could look at it that way. Like maybe the theologian is supposed to cause the atheists to doubt. As an atheist, I would say, um, gotcha, I'm already always doubting everything. Um, because most atheists, at least I think if you're being a good atheist, like... I don't mean being an atheist who's morally good. I mean, if you're good at being an atheist, if that's something you can be good at, um, what you should be doing is being skeptical of 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 all kinds of claims. You you know, um, and it's crazy. Uh, I've I've absolutely encountered atheists who are not skeptical, or like the only thing they're skeptical about is. Um, you know, God, right? Like, I don't believe in that. I doubt that the God that God exists, right? That's what they say. No, no kidding. I I I once met an atheist online who was all like, Yeah, you've got to be all rational, man. Um, you got to use reason, be skeptical, and doubt the existence of God. And I was like, Well, that's great. Be skeptical, use your reason. Yes, I agree. And then in the very next breath. Um, he goes on and launches into like uh, these 9-11 conspiracy theories, right? And if you know about the epistemic character of conspiracy theories, um, you know that uh, they are always dubious just by their very nature. Because conspiracy theories are kind of like backward science. Conspiracy theories start out with a conclusion, look for evidence to support the conclusion and ignore everything else. That's the opposite of how we're supposed to come to know things, empirically speaking. So yeah, absolutely, there are unreasonable atheists. Um, but if you're 
being a good atheist, I think you should practice some healthy skepticism about everything. Um, then again, that's not strictly necessary for being an atheist, right? Because there are scientists who practice skepticism, you know, in their day-to-day -day jobs when they're investigating nature, but they're religious, right? Um, Well, if, if well, if you don't, that's that's a good question. But if if God is not the greatest thing that can be fought, what is? Because remember, what Anselm is trying to do here is say that is not saying. Uh, he what he is saying is that the greatest thing, whatever the greatest thing you can conceive of, is that's God. So he would say. Oh, if you believe there's something greater than God that you can conceive of, well, then you were wrong about what you thought God was. God is the, the greater thing. That's what Anselm would say, right? Um, so I don't know. What do we think? What do we think? Uh, again, like you can you can accept the argument and and say yes i believe and this argument is part of the evidence for why i believe you can believe even if you don't buy the argument right it's because it's about faith you're not supposed to need reasons for religious belief or you can say it's a silly argument uh, and i'm not convinced i am still an, an atheist or an agnostic or something right Ooh, excuse me. I don't know. Thoughts? Any other thoughts before we move on? I get it. Yeah, I get that. I get it, Shane. Um, I don't want to disparage religion. Like, um, this is why I this is why I made the comment last time when I was reading the Dawkins quote uh, from from Richard Dawkins, how I even though I'm an atheist, I kind of can't stand him. Um, it's because, you know, he's just uh, kind of antagonistic. Um, you know, his book, The God Delusion, right? It's what a what a dumb title. Um it, I think it's wrong to paint religious belief as, as some kind of pathology. Um, it is a, uh, it is a human practice, right? It's a thing people do. Um, we're not doing it because we're dumb. We're doing it because we're human beings, right? And if you don't want to participate in it, fine. But you need to recognize that it's something that, people do it's a natural phenomenon um and dawkins doesn't seem to countenance that yeah yeah i mean yeah robin i think that's the point right um and again i'm not religious um but yeah the point uh, is that you're not you're believing in the absence of evidence that's the difference between faith and belief right and that's another another mistake that dawkins makes he's you know oh i, I don't believe anything i know uh, well okay but knowledge is a kind of belief like come on <laughs> knowledge is just a special kind of belief um so anyway yeah um i'm not religious but i don't think it's silly to be religious <laughs> As I said, it's a thing. We we humans are natural creatures. We are part of the natural world. And one of the things we do is have religions. Not every human has to subscribe to a religion, but it is a human practice. It's something we do. And we're a part of the natural world. So kind of like Dan, Dan Daniel Dennett would say, religion is like a natural phenomenon. It's part of the world. We're not weird for doing it. Maybe one day we won't do it anymore. Um, it's true that as societies develop more, as, as people's material needs are, are, are met, you know, better and better, people tend to become less religious. That is true. Um, maybe we can imagine some kind of hypothetical sort of Star Trek future where everyone's, uh, needs are met. No one is sick. There's no war that, you know, it's a sort of utopia. 
um, would there still be religion? Um, maybe, but far less than now, and certainly far less than there used to be, right? People used to be a lot more religious than they are today. Um, so anyway, um, let's go to the problem of evil. That's a fun one. Why does evil exist? What do we make of the existence of evil? There's a couple kinds of evils. Um, we can talk about moral evils. These are the evils that we do to one another. So murder, rape, torture, uh, theft. Co theft would compar be comparatively benign compared to all of these. Genocide, right? We've done some horrible things to one another. Yeah, you know, Robin, I don't I don't think that that's uncharitable, right? I mean, it people pe some people might take offense to that, but I I definitely understand the analogy. Um one of the things that religion does for people is uh provide meaning in life, right? And maybe um for some people that's more important than knowing something with certainty. For me, Knowing something with certainty is part of what gives me, gives me that meaning that I'm after. Um, then again, you know, I wasn't raised religiously. And I think you kind of have to be raised religious to to really get it. Because the few times that I've I've tried it out, it's been really weird. Um, you know, when other kids were maybe going to church, um, I was out in the field uh, looking for bugs and birds and and cool stuff. And then I'd, I'd go and look it up. I was a little, like a little scientist, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you need to maybe just accept Santa into your heart. Um Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, yeah, if, yeah, I guess that's something you, you would think about if you were like a counselor and, and you had a religious client. Yeah, you might, you would certainly want to try and use that framework as a basis for helping the client find, um, find not just meaning, but, but, um, but, but helping with their mental state, right? But yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, so Bronwyn, I, yeah, we agree about the upbringing thing. Yeah, you know, like when when other kids might have been at church, I was off being a little, little naturalist. So that's where I got that sort of urge to explain naturally, because I was literally looking out in the world and seeing all of this amazing stuff and wanting to know about it. And my go to were the books that I had, which were all science books. Um not religious texts. Uh, I remember a friend of mine when I was an undergraduate, um, I met a friend who uh, was, uh, or still is, um, a Baptist, I believe. And I mentioned, you know, oh, I've never been to church. It's just not the thing that I've ever done. And she said, well, come with me. Uh, check it out. Just see what it's like. You know, why not? What have you got to lose? So I said, okay, I will. And I did. Uh, and it was a very interesting experience. Um, I don't think I want to do it again. Uh, it was just strange to me. Um, it was one of those churches that was very like, you know, lots of songs. Um, you know, uh, there was um, probably 20 minutes of de devotional music, you know, with a live band. And then quick 10, 15 minute sermon. And then more, you know, 15, 20 minutes of more music. Uh, people were like, you know, reaching to the sky. And I was standing there, the only one with my eyes open, uh, very uncomfortably. Um, it was it was odd. Um, yeah, it was just weird. It was just weird. I'm not saying it was inherently weird. I'm saying it was weird for me. Because I, I was like, this is new. <laughs> um, so Robin says, uh, oh, you were brought up religiously. But don't believe in God, so I feel like you can grow up not relig religious. Yeah, that's true. Some people do. Um, yeah, some people do do that. 
Oh, really? Yeah. You sing there too, Hannah? I mean, music is important uh, for many aspects of life. And, you know, it makes sense to me why music would be used in a devotional context, because it, music stirs the emotions, right? So, you know, it absolutely makes sense why some some churches use it. Yeah, oh, I see, I see. That could just be a thing. Some people are like that. I've never been down with singing. I still remember my first day of kindergarten, uh, the very first day uh, when, and it's like, okay, we're gonna stand up and, and sing the national anthem. For the first couple of weeks, I didn't even stand up. I just sort of sat on the floor and kind of rocked. And uh, <laughs> and then when they finally did get me to stand up, I didn't sing. And I've never sung. I've never sung. So I, that just, just could be because because me, because I don't know. But yeah. But yeah, Milan, good point. Um, <laughs> community is also a big thing. Because religion also can form a part of one's identity. You know, I am this, I am a part of that community, right? This is more true for some religions than others, I think. Um, you know, Christianity, there are so many different denominations of Christianity. Um, but you, st I guess you still feel like you're all brothers in Christ or whatever, right? Um, there definitely seems to be uh a real sense of community there uh there's definitely a strong sense of community i think there's a strong sense of community in judaism and islam as well um you know with judaism you know there's the whole idea that um uh you know because of because of thousands of years of persecution there's this sort of like you know we stick together sort of attitude um and 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 one of the interesting features of Islam is that you know everybody everybody maintains uh, the the legit the liturg liturgical language has always been Arabic, right? So you know Christianity this has changed. It used to be it used to be Latin in the West and Greek in the East. Um, now it's English or whatever other language you speak um latin is no longer a lit liturgical language so everybody's reading the bible in different languages but everybody when they you know uh, muslims when they go and pray they're all praying at the same time in the same language pointing in the same direction which just just from from some of my muslim friends you know from what they've told me creates a real communal a sense of community right um so yeah, that's absolutely a good point. And that's one of the reasons why it's a, it's like a perfectly normal human thing. Oh, geez, we don't want to run out of time, though. Um, we got to talk about evil. So moral evils, the things we do to one another, uh, and the natural evils, these are like evils that occur in nature, or if you like, evils that are caused by God. The example in the book is the Lisbon earthquake. So this happened in Lisbon, Portugal in 1755. And we don't know exactly how many people were killed, but the number is probably between 10,000 10, to 100,000. Voltaire would reference this in, in his book, Candide, about a decade later. Uh, and there's lots of other natural disasters, too. N nowadays, we call them natural disasters, but... Uh, in 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 this terminology they're natural evils caused by god right so if there's a hurricane or a flood or anything like that that's a natural evil yeah any natural disaster um uh, usually ones that um <clears throat> that affect people but i suppose that also affect animals of course what is a natural disaster um the wildfires that we had uh, last summer, are they a natural disaster? You know, because of course um, uh, they're getting worse because of climate change, which is our fault. So are these 100% natural disasters? Well, maybe, maybe they're both moral and natural evil. Maybe they're a little bit at the same time, right? But if we're talking something like earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes, 
These are natural evils. Um, so um, these two types of evils pose a problem for the, uh, uh, the existence of God. There are actually two versions of this problem. There's the logical problem of evil and the evidential problem of evil. And each one poses a challenge to the existence of God because God is supposed to be not just all powerful and all knowing, but all good. And the idea is that the existence of evil is logically, at least when it comes to the logical problem of evil, that it's logically incompatible with the existence of God. So let's look at the logical problem of evil first. Um, J.L. Mackey, oh, there's a spelling mistake there. This is supposed to have an I right there. J.L. Mackey said this. He said the existence of evil is logically inconsistent with the existence of an omnibenevolent, omniscient, omnipotent God. Here is the argument. This is how Crumley sketches it. <clears throat> God exists and is omniscient, omnipotent, and all good. That's the first premise. But the second premise says evil exists. Now, an omnibenevolent God would not permit evil. It's just supposed to be all good, so he wouldn't permit it. An omnipotent being could prevent any occurrence of evil. And an omniscient being would know any instances of evil. So we've got this being that should, that should be powerful enough to prevent evil, good enough not to permit evil, and all-knowing such that he knows when evil's happening and can snuff it out. Yet evil exists. Compare this with the quote from Epicurus we looked at last time. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is not omnipotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Then whence cometh evil? Where does it come from? Is he neither able nor willing? Why call him God? Kind of a, an ancient expression of the same argument uh for the logical problem of evil that Mackey is making here now alvin plantinga has a response he says that uh and this is this is i remember a point that was raised way back earlier earlier on in the course oh excuse me uh, this is called free will theodicy. And the idea from Plantinga here is that God could not have created us genuinely uh, to be genuinely free if he completely disallowed evil. We're free. We have free will. And that means some of us are going to make the wrong choices sometimes. Um, so even if most people are going to turn out to be good, you're still going to have your the odd, you know, hitler or somebody like that you're going to have the odd evil despot the odd psychopath the odd serial killer you're still going to have the odd evil person and that's because they become evil through the choices they make fine what about natural evils though i mean humans don't cause those if if somebody commits evil Maybe we can say, oh, it's because they developed into an evil person because they had free will, they made the wrong choices, and they became evil. Okay, but if a volcano blows up and destroys an entire village, well, who did that? It's an act of God, is it not? So um, Plantinga's argument doesn't really do anything to save us from the existence of natural evils. But maybe those evils are only apparent. Maybe they're necessary for the greater good. That's another possibility. And if that's true, um, then the existence of evil is not logically in inconsistent with an omnibenevolent God. Although I have to admit, I am quite skeptical of that argument. Um, yeah. Uh, well, maybe I won't say anything more about this for now, just beyond the fact that I'm incredibly scared. I don't buy it. Um, I don't know. 
I, I don't, I, I'm doubtful of, of that just because um, uh, many of the people who are killed are innocent. And, you know, there's, there's efforts to solve that cognitive dissonance, right? Um, the, uh, like the, that's the whole idea is that, well, while well, natural evils are divine punishment. If a natural evil befalls a population, it's because they did something wrong. Uh, that's, uh, I don't know, like, uh, that makes me feel icky saying that. That's like, oh, God genocided us because we deserved it. I, I mean, no, that's, yeah, that's, that is cruel. That is a malevolent God who does that. Um, again, just my opinion, but. Yeah, because there's definitely some innocent people that die in natural disasters. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I mean, uh, this is my personal take, but no, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Um, and this also kind of speaks to our old uh, sort of animistic tendencies. Um, before it was God, it was the gods, and they. And before it was the gods, it was nature spirits. The world was alive, right? Remember, I mean, uh, the word uh, uh, from which um, the Greek Zeus and the um, Latin Jupiter uh, come from is um, Deus Petar, which is sky father. So we used to think that there was a god literally in the sky um who sent the lightning bolts um and sent the weather um and was a very capricious god um we didn't understand the natural processes at work um in the world and we thought there were beings in charge of these processes so it made sense then maybe to think that natural evils were caused by god or the gods uh, I don't think it makes any sense to believe that now. Um, but again, if you do believe that, I'm not trying to convince you otherwise. I'm just stating uh, what I think. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's kind of what I was getting at with the wildfires example. Um, now the natural evils might get worse so and 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 they might also be part natural evil and part moral evil because if we've messed up the environment with climate change um say the storms get worse right hurricanes get worse and cause more deaths um well yeah it's a natural disaster but it's com been compounded by human action so it's like a, both a natural and a moral evil, if you think about it. At least that's the way I see it. Um, whoops. All right, we're almost there. We're almost done. Um, the evidential problem. So that's the logical problem of evil. The idea that evil is logically inconsistent with a benevolent God. The evidential problem of evil goes like this. William Rowe claimed that the problem isn't just that evil exists. The problem is that there's just way too much evil. And a perfect God, you know, maybe he would have had to allow some evil, but not as much evil as there is, right? Sure, maybe we had to have free will. Um, and in order to really have free will, there has to at least be the possibility that we'll, some of us will commit evil deeds. But um, maybe God could prevent at least some of this suffering, right? Or natural evils, like forget about earthquakes and volcanoes and hurricanes. Just think about a prey animal being caught by a predator, right? What a horrible way to go. Or the example Crumley uses is uh, a, a poor little deer who's burned in a forest fire and spends hours, maybe days, suffering and dying. Why is that necessary? 
I my example that I like to go to is way back from I think they it was some BBC Earth thing. Um well people get killed by animals. I mean it does happen. Um but imagine imagine uh as in this bbc uh thing i think it was in the it was in the making mm. the making of sort of featurette that they always throw in with those bbc documentaries anyway the crew was filming these kimono dragons eating this um i don't know what it was a water buffalo or something anyway you do not want to get eaten by a kimono dragon right um when they bite you um they have that bacteria in their teeth that will cause your flesh to rot. So you die slowly. Uh, and it's not a fun way to go. And the crew is talking about how they had to film this poor animal being eaten by these kimono dragons over a matter of days. Like, why? Why? <laughs> you know, why is that necessary? That's what William Rowe is trying to say. Here's the argument as Crumley puts it. Oh, we'll go to the chat first. Oh, ouch. Yeah, that's right. They also have venom too, right? It's not just their dirty mouths. It's also uh, they can envenomate you. So you're in a lot of pain in addition to having your limbs rot away. Yeah, not a good way to go. Definitely not a good way to go. So here's Rowe's argument, schematized. There exist instances of intense suffering which an omnipotent, omniscient being could have prevented without thereby losing some greater good or permitting some evil equally bad or worse. An omniscient, holy good being would prevent the occurrence of any intense suffering it could, unless it could not do so there without thereby losing some greater good or permitting some evil equally bad or worse therefore there does not exist an omnipotent omniscient holy good being so god doesn't have to prevent all evil but he's got to prevent unnecessary evil plantinga's focused on necessary evil but roe is focused on the unnecessary evil it's these unnecessary evils that he thinks are incompatible with the existence of our all-powerful god a couple of weird, weird little blurbs finish the book off. Maybe God just knows best, right? Maybe we're like kids and God is the parent, you know? And um, to borrow Crumley's example, maybe when you're a child, you saw trips to the dentist as a cause of unnecessary suffering. I certainly did. Um, the dentist used to make me do the fluoride rinse. Oh, this is probably too much information. I don't know why I'm telling you this, but uh, they used to make me do the fluoride rinse, uh, like which is standard. You know, you gargle blah, 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 and you spit it out, right? Which, no problem. Uh, we also used to do it at school. Uh, the dental hygienist would come in every six months and we'd have this like little packet of fluoride and we'd have to gargle it and do, do this whole thing because it's good for your teeth, right? Um, but they were they would flavor this stuff uh, and the flavors made me ill. Like it was like a sensory problem or something. And I kept telling the dentist this. I'm like, oh, those, you can't make me do the fluoride, man. I'm going to be sick. Um, And every time I go to the dentist, they're making me do the fluoride. I thought, this is unnecessary suffering, darn it. Until one day, I'm doing the fluoride at the dentist and I can't help it. I become sick and I'm trying to gargle the fluoride. I get up. I run out of the dentist office full speed into the parking lot and just barf in the par parking lot because the flavor of the fluoride liquid was just so overpowering it made me ill. And then after that, the dentist finally stopped making me do it. He did, they did a little paste instead, which didn't taste as terrible. Yeah, I, it was a good save. Yeah, I was like, I I appreciate, you know, I think the dentist thought the same thing. He was like, I'm, well, I'm glad he didn't do that all over me. 
you know what, let's get him a, a fluoride alternative. Um, you know, but yeah, when I was a kid, I was like, why are you doing this to me, dentist? Maybe we're like that and God is the parents or the dentist or, or parents and dentist. Um, you know, the parents and the dentist know that you got to go to the dentist. You've got to maintain your oral hygiene and your oral health. You have to have healthy teeth and gums. It's very important. But no, like, come on, let's face it. No one likes going to the dentist. So maybe going to the dentist is like a necessary evil. Sure, you don't want unnecessary suffering. If the dentist is going to fill a cavity, you want him to, uh, you know, anesthetize your gum first. So you don't feel anything, right? You don't want, uh, if, if, if God is really omnibenevolent, God is the dentist who gives you the, the freezy stuff to numb your, your jaw before pulling a tooth out. But it seems that God just pulls the teeth out to, to use, uh, maybe, maybe to draw an analogy with what Roe is saying. You have a nice dentist. Wow. Okay. I mean, my dentist is cool too, but I still don't enjoy it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not like I'm like, oh, this is just wonderful having these met metal tools stuck into my face. Um, my dentist is pleasant. It's nice to see him, but I, I, I still don't enjoy <laughs> being there. <laughs> but hey, maybe you do. That's great if you do, right? Um, maybe suffering is necessary for the development of morality. I think this is incredibly suspect. Um, I mean, uh, sure, we're talking about the development of humanity, not just the, not, not necessarily individual development, but I don't know how, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to develop you you all in terms of your ability to to think about philosophy. Um, I don't think that suffering is necessary. I don't think I have to make you suffer for that in order to get that done. I, I personally, I don't think it follows that to develop, to further the, the development of humanity, you have to cause massive suffering. It just, it just doesn't follow. And uh, yeah, no, no problem. I mean, I don't want you to suffer. I think people learn better when they have fun. I mean, you know how, you know how like every non-human animal learns through play, right? And humans learn through play. Uh, they learn a lot of things through play and play is fun. Well, I mean, humanity might, might resemble a spoiled brat, whether or not there is a God, right? In fact, one could argue that that maybe it's religion that makes us that way. I mean, for example, in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, uh, everything is kind of made for us. The plants, the animals, everything. It's for people. Um. But it's not all religion's fault. Part of this also comes from the Greek rationalist tradition. The idea that we can stand apart from the world and understand it with reason. It's a Greek rationalist idea. And it's very different from, say, the outlook of like uh, indigenous communities, for example, uh, which see themselves as, as a part of the natural world, not separate from the natural world. So it's a little bit of religion, a little bit of philosophy. I'll blame them both equally. Um, for making us think that we're special. Um, but we might act that way, even if, you know, whether or not there is a God, we'll, humans would probably act that way, right? The final point is God's participation in suffering. This is the weirdest place to end the book. This is honestly so weird. There's not even an afterword or anything. It's just maybe God participates in, in human suffering by becoming one of them. 
And of course, the 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 allusion here is to Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, who if, if you're a Christian, it's Jesus Christ, because Jesus is the son of God, but also he is God um, being tortured and killed to absolve humanity, uh, to absolve you of your sins. Um, why is this a weird place to end the book? Well, what are you supposed to do with this if you're not a Christian, right? Forget about atheism or agnosticism. There's like all the other religions um, and uh, they're all pretty different from Christianity. So what are you supposed to do if you're not a Christian? Um, I don't think this argument can appeal to anybody who's not Christian. Otherwise, people would be Christian, right? I mean, what do we think? Like, God participates in the suffering of humans by becoming one of them? What other religion has anything like that? I can't think of one. I think it's just Christianity. I could be wrong, but I think it's just Christianity that 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 does that. Mm. Yeah, so so that's like um that sounds uh Jivitesh, I hope I'm I'm pronouncing your name correctly. That sounds a lot like Plantinga's position, where we have free will in order to truly be free there's at least going to be the possibility that evil happens. But then, yeah, the, the, the sort of long outlook is that if you do evil things, you'll be punished. Um, you know, you'll be sent to hell or something. Right. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the idea. But again, I mean, I think these, 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 th these, in, these notions work if you're already religious, right? Um, I'm not certain how convincing they are to, uh, agnostics or atheists, but, um, but maybe, maybe one of these is the answer to why evil exists. And again, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, excuse the terminology. I'm not trying to evangelize to all of you, right? Okay. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Like, uh, like, like Krishna right he came into the world right he was an avatar of 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 someone is isn't that right i don't know a whole lot about hinduism but uh correct me if i'm wrong ah uh, yeah okay the avatar of rama yeah okay okay yeah so when krishna came or when rama came as krishna is is he a man like is he human or is he a god or vish oh vishnu i like vishnu because wisdom yeah yeah vishnu is vishnu he's a he's like a wisdom god so i like just because i'm a philosopher uh, that's why i like vishnu so vishnu okay so when vishnu comes as 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 um as uh krishna is 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 he a human or is he like a god or a demigod still when he comes into the world? Because Jesus comes in, in Christianity, Jesus is a person, but he still has these divine attributes like the ability to perform miracles, right? I wonder if something is similar with Krishna. I think probably, but I don't know as much about Hinduism as I do about like the Abrahamic religions. But yeah, you're right. So like on Hinduism, you know, there's there's like, ideas like dharma and karma right there's there's things you got to do okay yeah so yeah yeah i'd say like kind of semi-divine um but yeah you're right in hinduism you know they do something completely different with the problem of evil um right you know because there's dharma there's karma and, and different notions like that um, and that's the, that's one of the unfortunate things about a lot of uh, philosophy textbooks. Um, they do um, they do tend unless you're taking a course specifically in uh, Eastern philosophy, for example, uh, what you're going to learn about is going to be primarily Western. Um, you know, Crumley does an okay job of including other perspectives, but but his work is, you know, situated well within Western philosophy. I think that's something that's starting to change. Um, 
Um, which is good, which is good, because like I said before, you know, um, these, this is something that humans all over the place do. Humans all over the world um, have different religions, have done philosophy in various ways. Um, and I think it would be really great if we could expand um, the canon, as it were, to go beyond just, you know, great Western works. You know, there are, there are really, uh, there are, um, you know, the ancient Indian tradition is really philosophically rich. So is the Chinese tradition. Uh, there's great um, Islamic philosophy as well from the Islamic golden age. Some really great stuff there. Um, it's really interesting to learn about indigenous um, religions and philosophies because they tend to be a lot more holistic. Um, like I said before, you know, um, on on christianity or even if you're a philosopher in the western tradition you probably think of humanity as in some sense separate from the rest of nature or the rest of creation but um but a lot of indigenous cultures don't see it that way right instead we are part of the world not separate from the world we're not special in that we can stand apart from the world where we depend on the world and we're a we're, we're we're a part of it right wow we're all, we're just about done um why don't we end it there but good good discussion everyone what a great class we this the the, the reason you know this is just a weird spot to end on you know because it's like hey maybe jesus i don't know and it's, it's like okay i would have liked at least an afterword on you know, all of the things we've covered, all the things we've learned, but, but in any case, we've made it through the entire text. So you should all give yourselves a pat on the back. Good work sticking with everything. Um, you know, this is not the easiest first year class I've ever taught. This is a trick. This is probably one of the most difficult first year philosophy classes I've taught. I think you've all, um, uh, done really well here. How long is the essay? I would shoot five to seven pages it says 1,200 to 1,500 words. Uh, double space, 12-point font, that will put you somewhere between five and seven pages. Um, you can go more than that, but don't go under the word limit or the page count, right? Yeah, no, fair enough. It's challenging. You know, it's, it's tricky stuff, but you all stuck with it and you all did really, really good. So uh, our final class is on Friday. It's kind of like our makeup class for the one we didn't have on Thanksgiving Monday. I'm not going to lecture. It's just going to be me sitting there answering questions you have about the final or the uh, or the essay, which is which will be due that evening. Um, I cannot really read essays ahead of time um, because it wouldn't really be fair. Um, like we're evaluating what you submit. Um, and that's that I can answer questions about your paper, um, but I can't. I, I can't really, in the interest of fairness, I can't read it over and give you comments. Um, writing services will do that for you, but I can't do it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, Muhammad, that's right. Yeah, you've answered Dylan's question. Uh, you can use my slides. Um, what you would really want to do is cite the lectures. Oh, you mean when you're, oh, sorry, sorry. I thought you meant like to take a look uh, beforehand. Um, no, it really should be a file. Um, so if you hit, yeah, if you've hit 1,280 words, but you're only four pages, that's probably fine, Bronwyn. Um, yep, you can have block quotes. Um, uh, you'll you'll want to cite my lectures. You won't actually be citing the lecture slides. You'd be citing my citing my lectures. Um, there are, there are instructions for how to do this on Purdue's online writing lab. And by the way, not any. This is not for anyone specifically. But I'm getting an awful lot of questions on the Discord about citation. Um, all of this is on the online writing lab. Like you you don't need to ask me. How do I cite this or that? Like it's it's all there. Uh, it's it's the complete APA guide. Anything you could possibly think of citing, they'll tell you how to cite it. So you 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 absolutely do not need to ask me. 
um it's it's there right um yeah yeah it does count towards so if you use like two of my lectures that's two sources yep um i don't know if i'll have uh the essay done for them um i'm gonna try but it is an incredibly crazy time of year um so i don't know if you'll have the second test before then the grades that is but we're working on it as fast as we can yes you can use sources from the book a yes friday's lecture will be recorded so yeah if you miss it you can you can absolutely catch up um so bring bring all your questions um yeah like if you cited the book and 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 a lecture that's two different sources yeah that's fine that's fine so um yeah if you miss friday um uh i you know it will be recorded um but bring your questions about the final uh or bring questions about material like if if you're kind of like hey i'm still not sure about this concept or that concept or this thought experiment or this argument the, the, bring those questions and we'll we'll hash it out together um and, and i'll tell you a little bit about the exam about what to expect on the exam the exam is going to be just like a larger version of the tests you know take home you'll have the entire exam period to do it but once you start there's a time limit it's open book but you should study beforehand it's just like the the quizzes except longer and it will be cumulative the the the, the quizzes were non-cumulative the exam will be cumulative well that's all i have for you today um Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you all on Friday. Bye for now, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone. If you if I don't see you all again on Friday, um, it's been a really great uh, time. I've had a good uh, I've had a good time. Uh, I'll tell you the number of questions on Friday, Muhammad. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's fine. That's two sources. That's my lecture and that's Crumley's chapter. So that's two different sources. Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. It's better to be safe than sorry, right? All right, thanks everyone. All right. See you all on Friday.